nice to meet you all. Good morning for some of you, I guess. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you had a good, good night morning. yesterday um, and a good party. So we're going to start slowly with the workshop. Uh, first, we're going to have a very quick presentation about how it's going to go down and what are the topics that we're going to discuss and what the ports are, although we want to open as many questions as possible so that we are then forming groups of people, teams, sort of, and then addressing the four topics and opening up as many questions and learning as much as possible from all of us. Um, I think that this is quite a diverse group, so we all have different types of knowledges. Um, and if we make it a bit interdisciplinary, I think this is going to be quite great for us. Uh, so yeah, my name is Anya, uh, Anya Bai. I'm a lawyer. Um, I am actually focused on the international line of space law, uh, but more or less I'm working in a blockchain space as well. So we're trying to um, open up an unlocked company. This is Marina, my <laughs> partner. <laughs> yeah. um, she's going to talk about herself by herself, so I'm not going to be um, talking on her behalf. So yeah, we're actually um, kind of finding what the proper legal entity for DAOs might be. This is what we work on um, in Unlock. Uh, finding what the right jurisdiction might be and what are the legal obstacles on our way to create DAOs and to create a good environment here. Also talking to some regulators and finding out a lot of stuff. Here. So yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Marina. I'm very happy to see you all here. Um, very a lot of familiar faces. Um, so we are also happy to have two facilitators with us that are experienced facilitators: uh, Max from Geekov and uh, Felipe from Nasdaq. Uh, so, uh, we are also part of DGO, especially Anya, and she is a founding member of DGO, and we learned a lot from this community, which is actually organizing events and um, working on a strategy for governance for uh, different blockchains. Maybe you can also say a uh, word about DGO. Right. Like DGO connects uh, more than 500 researchers now from fields, from political science to technology, try to assign cross-functional, get cross-functional people together to move uh, these complex uh, issues forward. I mean, we have been seeing a lot of different presentations and panels, and I, I heard um, when there were questions, really tough questions asked, they say, um, it depends on the governance we are going to adopt. So every time we're talking about governance, but we don't know what this is actually. And this is also the idea of our workshop. So we would like, we were thinking, okay, what would we like to discuss? And if we think about governance, forking is the extreme event that could happen actually. And um, then we were asking, how much do we know about forks? Who is talking about forks? Who is um, preparing plans to, uh, for the readiness for forks? This was our um, actually stunt, um, additional idea. Um, so, as we said, we have a really short presentation and then we're going to work in groups. After that, uh, also the groups are going to have um, a presentation about their work. So, the method. We were thinking of having um, um, a method where you, you might be used to, um, for example, um, different types of competitions. One of those is a moot court. Anya can tell more about this. Yeah, so I don't know how many of you read the description of the workshop. Um, firstly, it was <laughs> it was envisioned more, like, uh, more or less like a moot court. Um, it's a legal thing. You go on a competition and you present the arguments for both of the parties um, in order to convince the judges. And what I like about it so much is that the judges are usually the real judges. So it's not an imaginary case. It's actually the real law that we use and the real judges are in front of you. So uh, whatever the case is, they are actually getting the knowledge on how a um, case in the future might be solved um, using the laws that we have. Um, and right now we are actually, we might be imagining a case for a fork, but what we have is real. So whatever uh, scenario we are going to have, whomever we are going to speak to, uh, it might actually be used somewhere in the future. And what is really important about moot courts is the argumentation. So if we are taking like a step, we say, okay, we want to do that, but this is the argument why we need to do that or why this is important, and we would really like to work on that in, in the groups. So we're not really going to go with a moot court because this is a smaller group and we're not really having a case in front of us. So with a moot court, we usually have a couple of months of, uh, not comparison, but uh, preparation. preparation yeah. So we only have two hours, so we'll drop that idea and we're just going to form groups of people and have a discussion like we're used to. But still using the argumentation part. 
and um, having a presentation, maybe challenging each other with different questions. So the issue is the fork. Uh, what, are, what are forks? Um, when are they happening? Uh, how are we reacting to it? Uh, who are the stakeholders in this um, fork ecosystem? So we can tell you a little bit about the history, um, Anya. Uh, yeah, so what forks are, it's basically just a suite of the protocols. Uh, we have different types of forks, but we want you actually to, and us together, to think about uh, new types of forks. So it might not really be just soft forks and hard forks, it actually might be uh, more relevant to think about what are the reasons for forks, and then create new types of forks or new consumption for forks based on those reasons that we are um, uh, having uh, the issues. So the history of forks, probably everyone here is familiar with the DAO fork, uh, which was pretty much the bug. Um, and when you go through a history of all forks, you see that there is different reasons, and the bug is one of the reasons. So the bug actually functions like a trash bag. Um, in order to actually solve that fork, we are kind of in the whole community creating a defense mechanism. So we are communicating how we're going to fork so that we prevent the hacking, so that we prevent the malicious um, abuse of the code. But all the forks are not going to be necessarily based on um, something that is maliciously conducted on the, for, uh, on the code. It might as well be just an upgrade of the code. And these are the hot forks that we are now seeing the presenting and the upgrade of the code in Ethereum. Um, so yeah, this is actually uh, what types we were thinking of. You might have a client which is because of the bug or the hack, and then you have spin-offs, which is just the altcoin. So somebody copy pastes um, the code, and this is all open source. So uh, there's questions like for lawyers, whether this should be patented or are there any breaches of the um, IP rights and stuff like that. So we are talking here about governance. We don't want to go into technical details, but we, everybody, or at least it's really easy to copy paste the code, but we would like to think about the governance. So if we are doing, for example, for example, a spin-off uh, of a coin, what, um, what governance is included here? Are we talking to the community? How are we communicating with the community? Uh, also, at the opening of DEF CON, uh, we were hearing about Byzantinium, and they were also saying, we need to focus on communication to our stakeholders, so exchanges, uh, different other organizations. This is like a plan for uh, the next years for our um, blockchain, so how are we communicating that internally and also externally to, to the whole community? Okay, so this is something that NATO um, came up with, or um, the political science in the international field um, of law. Readiness action plan is pretty much um, the plans that governments are having when the shit goes down. <laughs> so uh, when there is, a, for example, a threat or an impact on the nation state, um, the NATO and all the international communities are actually having the readiness plans. So how they're going to react on that threat. And what, it, what is happening with courts, if it's not really a community thing, if it's not really just an upgrade, then we have to be ready as much as possible. So DEFCON has a B, America has DEFCON with a F, and they have different stages, and according to how bad the threat is, that um, actually creates the stage, um, and that creates the reaction plan for them. Uh, they actually have all the ready and section plans um, prepared ahead, so that people know how to react appropriately and as fast as possible and be as efficient as possible. So on the next slide, we actually have um, what it should be all about, um, to have as possible swift and friendly responses um, that we can create, and then um, that we have a proper deterrence and defense policy mechanism. So for that to happen, we actually first need to discuss what types of forks we have, what are the issues that we are addressing, um, what are the obstacles, is it actually good to fork or not, um, this is something that Vlad proposed. Um, but we also formed a couple of other questions that we might want to address. And we have four different types of um, groups that we want to create, but since there's not so many of us, we can also go with two types of groups. Um, so if we go to... Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so this is just a picture <laughs> that presents that we want to uh, collaborate in teams and have a discussion ready. Um, so we're going to have two facilitators. Let's form two groups. Um, and then let's just discuss all these topics. Um, maybe we can even merge two of the groups together. Um, so we have four of them. One is type of the fork, uh, motivation for forks, 
whether to fork or not to fork. And then we have fork communication, which is pretty much relevant for the governance um, and the communication of the community. And then the fork technicalities. So if anyone feels um, ready to talk about the code and the technical aspects of the fork, then this is pretty much the group to go with. Um, so we see that here in the group we know some people, um, but we don't know all of you. Um, we were also thinking of having different groups in, and also like um, ideas interacting with each other uh, from the legal point of view, communication point of view, or technical point of view. You can also form groups uh, if you would like to just talk to lawyers or just to uh, <coughs> tech people, uh, developers. Um, we are very flexible in how to form those groups, but those are some suggestions. Uh, from our side. So uh, we also discussed with Vlad and he was um, urging us to ask a very important question. Yeah, we actually have it already. Okay, so. Um, yeah, I can read it out loud. Yeah. But I think it's uh, better if we just form two, two groups. Um, so one would be types of the groups and motivations for the groups. I think these two are very connected to each other. Um, Regarding on the motivation of a fork, that might actually uh, create a taxonomy. So we are just going to merge those, and we have two hours, so don't worry about time. I think we have more than enough time to actually go through all these questions. And then we can merge the fork communication with the fork technicalities. Um, depends on the technicalities of the fork that might actually direct on how we communicate and how, which tools we use and who are the stakeholders that are actually communicating the fork. Um, so if you feel okay to that, Let's just make two post-its, um, two groups, and then we split into two groups. Um, we have two facilitators. Um, they're going to take care of the timing. Um, also, they're going to have the, all the questions presented um, in front of them. So we might have you guys um, to ask the questions. And then at the end of it, um, somebody, if we have a long here, can just um, take the notes, and then we have a discussion, and we go later on the discussion about it, so what we think uh, are the other group is smaller, we can also discuss in one group, um, and <laughs> it, it really depends on what you're interested in and what would you like to discuss. I mean, do you have an idea? Have you been asking yourself about those questions? Not, not really, I mean... No, not the questions, actually. I mean, I think because the communication is not quite standardized, um, yeah. there's a lot of uh, questions about what's actually happening. How, how it works today. This is just, uh, obviously it's a good uh, process to just say, yeah, we need to do this technical upgrade, and then it's actually a fork. It doesn't really feature it. <laughs> so, okay. do, do you think about just forming a circle, and then sure. like, yeah. all the questions together? I mean, when we're discussing this, do you feel that you have enough information about forks and what is actually happening? Both of the BTC and the BCH fork, 
and the ETC, ETH mm -hmm. fork. That in both those cases, you ended up creating something that was more than once, right? Mm -hmm. the, with ETA, ETC, you brought in a bunch of people who haven't been into that, that into Ethereum before, but, you know, but felt like they could, um, it just didn't look interesting to them. And then with BTC, BTH, you, certainly the market price of, of the combined thing was, was greater than the previous market price for the fraud, um, at least in that era. And then we had at least the era when BCH and BSB split off, and that had the opposite effect, that it just, I guess, kind of diluted the, the community. I would like to complement that observation with that I totally even don't know about that, and that there is this different perspective on the ports of what we do with the community and the promise of immutability of smart contracts and so on that has nothing to do with the resulting market prices but mm -hmm. is almost just like okay it's a PR element that is divorced though from the uh, value of the currency on the chain but it's just like okay do we now ruin the, the actual promise right there were a lot of people on the fence that were not local that felt like well maybe the fog should not happen Speaking specifically about Ethereum now. Yeah, yeah, the first the first fork and then yeah. Bitcoin's always more vocal. <laughs> yeah. Because you you've got kind of two decision points as a user, right? When when there's a if there's a ch there's a change to your the system that you're using, firstly you, the, there's the question of do you actually support the change or not? Um, but then one, if the change goes and goes ahead and happens, the question is then do you then support it to the extent of supporting minor, a minority branch? Um, and do you actually think that it's worth actually having that division over it? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you decide if it's well, worth right. it? Well, right. So part of it, I guess, is just whether it's something that's fundamental to you mm -hmm. as part of the value of the mm -hmm. thing, right? So for the ETC guys, you know, if you've got something that can be tampered with by some social process, then for them, there's just, there's just no point in even being part of that. That's just not something that's interest, interesting. And the same, I think, was true with the BTC and BCH fork, that as far as the BCH guys were concerned, the whole thing they were trying to do was build cash for everybody. And that if you said, then say, OK, we're not going to scale this, the, you know, scaling is not very important to us. Um, I know that there are arguments about, OK, we're going to scale a different way, but in, at least in the short term, um, people, you know, it was a community that wasn't really interested in using this as money for everybody, then as far as most of the BCH guys are concerned, that's just not even something that they're, they're interested in doing. Um, so, so even though they lose this huge network effect, they lose the brand, they lose all the stuff that Bitcoin has, but for them, it's just not worth while being in Bitcoin. They'd rather have their own thing, even if it does turn out to be a nice so in, a, in a general sense, what I'm hearing is that at the heart of a fork, be it a technical issue or not, or a bug, or a hack, in the end, the main reason for the fork is a disagreement or a divergence on principles and values. In, at least in, uh, well, at least until the BSV one. I think the BSV one's more of this use of personality. Um, and, and if you're doing, and what we're doing when we have a, a, a dispute like this is basically, I mean, it's politics. And once you're doing politics, then obviously, as well as values, you have personalities and factions. And, uh, I would like to disagree with that proposition because yeah. I think in the end, uh, it was always just about money, nothing else. Just and it was mining interests, like miners, being a bit behind the scenes in Bitcoin. And in Ethereum, it was just the core community having invested in the DAO. Mm -hmm. And it would not have been them, the port would not have happened. It but what about the parity thing? Hmm? What about right. the parity thing? Well, it's just not enough of the core community involved because it's just a couple of people who well, have lost their money, right? And so it's not ETC enough. had proven. Uh, that was very costly to do this because that was not expected at all, right? right. Everybody thought everything yeah. was going to go over. But still, you have vested interests, like somebody lost money or stands to gain money, or somebody's losing power or stands to gain power, the miners that in Bitcoin. And I think actually the people who are interested in the principle usually are pretty silent and don't really meddle in the, in the, uh, in the battles. Principles are not driving the force or not. And I would say that probably on a chain that doesn't have money as a token on the chain, you wouldn't have this kind of debates and politics about force. Okay, so it's more, in your point of view, it's more pure game theory. No, no. No, we, just money. <laughs> game theory is something wonderful. <laughs> how is the, how is the uh, TCMTH work 
driven by money here? There's a lot about the power of miners, right? When depending on uh, how you uh, see that history, it was a lot about people behind the scenes pulling strings, making sure stuff goes through, goes not through, uh, because it's better for the for the established yeah. caching power. So, and that's not necessarily what comes up first, but I think it's little people doubt that. Uh, so in the case of Bitcoin, it's very obvious that like, the value of the network is money. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's like the community and, uh, and people working together to generate it, but like it's, it's, it's in the money. Like for example, in some network where like value would be just like workforce or something like that, I expect that this could be the, at the heart of you know, all the debates and stuff. And I think that more than money is like, like where value accrues and I don't know, like, because in the end, like, uh, it just takes that, oh, is there, like, no stakes at all on anything, obviously, like, I'm not, get, I'm not going to need governance to go, you know, to decide on what the, and here, like, in, in this pre precise case, like, yeah, the other days, uh, the stakes are, uh, it looks I like the stakes are money and stuff, I don't know, like, maybe, I don't know, maybe money, maybe, 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 about money. Like, value, value, I would say value more than money. Yeah, but there are three different things involved, right? The one is, like, Bitcoin as a payment tool, the other is people having Bitcoin, and then there's people making Bitcoins by mining. And I'm not sure what we pretended is being the cause of the fork was actually always why the fork was pushed for. Yeah. So and that was a big political game, but I don't think it would ever be so politically charged and so loud if it was just about technology. Mm -hmm. So would you say that we kind of need a new taxonomy since, I mean, we are already um, talking about the reasons for the fork. Uh, there might be money incentives, value incentives, uh, there might be reasons like bugs and just uh, upgrades. I wouldn't necessarily say that the forks are happening for the money reasons, but it's just about the upgrade of the code. So well, well, I guess, sorry. Yeah. No, no, well, when the people that are deciding the forks at the end of the day are the miners, so, then they're driven by money, because they invest all this capital and like, mining so, like, but the developers, their reasoning is different. Like, it could be for bugs, for upgrades. But it's ultimately like the miner's decision with who who is you know more correct. Like, if a fork happens, like they're like this chain is going to be more valuable, so we're going to go with that one. Ultimately, they have to base their decision based on value because of the capital investment that they've already made. But that's also only this half of the picture. Yes, and it would be more true without money. I think. Was a chain without the money value, it would just be the miners deciding whether that Yeah, the developers so. still need to merge well, the code. The exchanges, right? EDC mm -hmm. became possible because they started to be listed. Otherwise, nobody would have cared. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in the case of the BTC BCH split, basically the miners were defeated, right? The, the miners, uh, certainly the majority of the miners wanted a block size upgrade. And, you know, the LP on what they were dead and they couldn't get it, uh, was, was the, uh, the ultimate outcome. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a chain. It's like the miners do it based on profit, but it becomes legitimate based mm -hmm. on if exchanges like adopt it. So it's like they're taking a risk that this is gonna like bring them more profit, but it's like a gambling game. So you have to like figure out okay which one, which path should we go. So I'm hearing two things. One is who are the stakeholders? So miners, developers, exchanges, who are Users. very important. Yeah, well, it has a trajectory, and it's like a, it's like path. It's like first it's the developers, and it's the miners, and it's like the exchanges, and it's the users, right? It's like the the flow. It's like a. I don't think yeah. it's flow. It's probably just like it's a web of things that yeah that change each other. Yeah. Because I mean, if the developers see oh this this thing is highly like. Well, developers then, slash Twitter. It's sorry? like you know, <laughs> developers slash Twitter. No, first, yeah, that's like, it's like yeah. the sentiment. Okay, this is block upgrade. It's like. Everybody thinks it's a bad thing, but we know it might be technically a good thing. Mm -hmm. Just because it's technically a good thing doesn't mean that everybody will adopt it. Just yeah. So, so it still so has to be merged. When it is adopted then. Sorry? When it is adopted then. Like well, which also then depends on exchanges and yeah. like the, what, what other people say. I don't so think there's clear, I mean, as far, well, as far as like taxonomy, I think we, the, the ones like hard software, software. We, I think we have to just, the, 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 like the 
like a technical taxonomy mm -hmm. of just yeah. like the very technical dimension of what is actually happening in the if you will code and then there's also like the social dimension where you think, okay, does the community actually split is there people in that community things like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, hard, I, I think hard, the words hard fork and soft fork are almost not worth using in this discussion. In the, I mean, they're they're, they're, a, they're a kind of a, t a technical detail yeah. of, of how how an upgrade is done. Um, but I think what we're mainly talking about here is economic forks, right? We're talking about whether the community splits or the currency splits. Um, yeah. So, so normally I would, I would call that an economic fork when you when you end up with effectively two separate currencies. Um, but then, but then within economic forks, there are, I guess, different motivations and different ways that you pay. The thing is that you can do it with a soft fork. Um, well, you can you can do an economic fork also with a soft fork because if you don't accept the soft fork and you lose the hash rate uh, majority, um, then uh, sorry, if you if you don't accept the soft fork and you gain a hash rate majority, then you get an economic fork. Right? Um, and if you have a hard fork, you also get. An economic fork. But would you? But you would you have two separate? Chains. Yeah. So, so if you so so a, a, a soft fork that results results in two chains is kind of a failed soft fork in the, in the so it's a, a, a soft fork that doesn't get a hash rate majority. In that situation, um, you, I think I think this is right. You'll, yeah, you'll get yeah. you'll get two 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 chains, assuming that some people continue with trying to do the upgrade, even though it didn't get the mining majority. Um, with a hard fork, you necessarily get two chains. So, so is it um, something that was happening at the beginning, like um, we haven't seen these economic forks in the last, I don't know, few months, year? Um, is, do you, do you right. see something like this coming up I mean, in Ethereum or in like Bitcoin or in any other? I think the, the most interesting case is like, like Rybox, for example, or Nab or whatever. Then the developers have been sued because they did not fork. Like there's a class action lawsuit going on because an exchange got hacked and the developers decided to not fork and basically save these funds. That is sort of the, I would say, like an economic not fork, but it's true. And it's, I think that's for me one of the very interesting cases where governments and like um, who's actually responsible for making you know, like deciding what are the exceptions that you can actually decide on. I think that's the sort of thing where it gets very interesting. Because all of a sudden, because they don't have the governance system where then you have clear like distinction of okay, who's responsible for this and this and this and how's like decision making process, they just have like developers themselves and like class action lawsuits basically on their hands. Because they did not afford. So that's one of the questions when we are having the network effort. So say that we actually have one community that decides and we are able to at least partially identify the stakeholders that are going to uh, provide us with those answers, whether we want to have those actions or not. And if we lower the amount of barriers with forks, uh, I think they call it zero barrier or zero fork, um, that means that there is plenty of options to create a lot of forks and split the community. And all of a sudden we have more and more communities but less and less stakeholders that are actually governing the whole system. But at the same time, I mean, that might actually be good because it brings a lot of diversity into the system. Who says that it's only good to have one community that is going to decide that? All I don't think, I don't think it's good. It's just, it's just it's good to have a, like a, like an actual process of like a the place where you can say, okay, this is how we handle things. This is how we decide on exceptions and things like that. So a higher threshold of certainty is better than to not really know who are the stakeholders and to just go with the flow. Not right. just to have a process no, in place. Process. <laughs> like for elections. For example, elections. it could be yeah. it could be very simple election say, okay, we we elect twenty one block producers, let's just say twenty one for uh, for fun, um, who decides how basically the code is governed, etc. And then if there was um, like lost with at least 21 people who basically the people who would have to deal with like uh, people come in and say okay we think what you did was wrong um, based on that okay what can you do for us basically so, so that, that's, a, that's another way of saying that we're creating if you this is the, the problem with creating a process and this is why ultimately mm -hmm. you kind of have to have forking as the ultimate fallback is that if you create a process then that gives you a point of attack 
Yeah. So, so for, for crypto people, when we, we think of the government, you know, of a court order to do, do something, we consider that an attack generally. Um, but you, you could you could also think of it could be something kid, kidnap those guys or rape those guys. And any formalized process that you have brings in some um, you know some kind of uh, possi possibility of, of attacking you. Yeah, um, that's and, and, um, so I, I mean, you you can kind of, I guess if you, if you think about about it compared to normal sort of forms of government, you can kind of think think of the sort of the, the economic fork like a coup d'état as a, as opposed to having a constitution. Right? So so when you change a constitution you can you can have a kind of formalized um, I don't know if this makes sense. You, you can have you can have a formalized method of, yep. of changing that constitution, constitution that, yeah. that gives you this one chain. And if everybody you know believes in that process then you only ever get one clear centre of power. Um, but in some situations That's when like Right, that's right, yeah, like that's right. Um, yeah, or it's built in. Right, right. But in, in some situations where that gets subverted, the ultimate fallback is always we say, I'm not going to the police, I'm not going to obey you. But that's assuming so there is a constitution in place. And that's yes. Not the case. So, so, yeah, uh, yeah. they grow up in some sense in governance in itself. They would just yeah. like a non they would try to press, we don't have a formal governance process, but they it's, yeah. and that's why they. It is nice for something. I think it's also like you have got a certain like use case in community and acquired consensus might be adapted for something like Bitcoin. Kind of that be something we need to make it more something more formalized for something like uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, or something. I don't know. Yeah, to to move like quicker or to have more clarity in certain the process. For example, Bitcoin is like it doesn't move a lot. You don't have the, I, I, from what I understand, we don't have that many decisions. Take daily, and so a rough consensus is okay, and it's healthy, but it's like safe, safer or in some way. Yeah, one question that I have, for example, is do we want to create this process and formalize or maximize fork readiness to facilitate and help forks to happen, or do we want to avoid forks happening? Because, yeah. because I feel that an economic fork is always a traumatic experience. Uh, has a has a risk because uh, the, the power of an economy is directly related to the amount of uh, people embedded in that economy. The community. Not, not community, just, just a sheer absolute weight of value embedded in that economy gives it resilience. A, a smaller economy is more manipulable. It's you can you can really a smaller actor can have a heavy influence. It's easier to move the money by making. Uh, so actually, s scale, in my point of view, is now stepping out of us and being participating and having an opinion. Scale is a good thing. Like we, we should aim for scale and economic forking is a dangerous gambit. Like, what is the fucking classic today? Yeah. And they, were, they just got 51 percent a few months ago. And nobody cared. And nobody gave a fly. Or at least in our community. Is there anything left? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it didn't like affect it financially that much. Not at all, actually. Yeah. But well, because I, I would support that we should be asking here what direction do we even want to regulate. So do we want more force or less force? Is, yes. what, what, is the, what is the target of that process? Or is there protection of what? Developers, as you brought up, right? Against class actions, for example. Or, coin holders, or miners, or exchanges, they all have their investments, and who are we going to protect with this procedure, or maybe non-procedure, because mm -hmm. that can be attacked. Um, and I, mean, I don't agree with the basic premise you just said, um, about the traumatic experience to the yeah. economy, and that it has to be as big as possible. So I think there's probably a lot of untapped potential in the technology that right now might be held back by the stability that's being enforced by the economic interests. I don't know, but that's, that's, the, that's the polarity that has to be negotiated. Yeah. And so that, that's why the upgrade fork, the ideal, like, it, are we want, do we want to be conservative or do we want to move forward? And I, I think what I'm trying to get, I'm starting to see is that there is an invisible fork line in, embedded in the community where if we approach that line, there's the incentive for the split starts to grow. If anything, what we should do is create mechanisms to make this fork line visible and make people create, make sense, sense make around the fork line. So predictable. Well, just get people to talk about it, it's a good idea. Like, what is, what is the moment where... But this is why I 
I brought up interests of miners that were not quite up. So, mm -hmm. uh, with ETC, is Bitcoin maximalists attacking Ethereum? That is probably part of the picture. So why do forks even happen at all? And also this other fact that I feel lots of technicians actually stay on the fence. They go either way. They're not even too vocal. They don't have this kind of opinion. They might have an opinion about box stats and so on, right? What's better? But um, the driving factors behind forks should probably be on the table, and maybe then the whole thing becomes a very simple story. So that's what I thought is being clear in Ethereum, because I thought that proof of stake is always going to be on the table. So the miners knew what they were going into from the whole beginning. Yeah, proof but of stake is not, not coming because of the miners. That's what's I mean, here. Yeah. The, the time bomb was not built out to please the miners. Okay. It was taken back because technolo technologically it's not there. Yeah. So, I mean, what is Ethereum doing right now like to get ready for the fork? Um, how are they communicating to the miners, to the community? What's the plan? Do they have a plan? Uh, Ethereum 2.0 is technically yeah. ready? Yeah. Oh. No, 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 no. But like, no, um, like the presentations that we were listening to was like, how do we, if there is going to be a new idea of a suggestion for the upgrade of the software, what is going to be the governance, what are the rules, how to discuss within the community, who can actually make a suggestion when the decision is made. Um, Forking? Yeah. I think it's going to be a pure power play, right? This is the Wild West, so the guys with the most power win, and that's why I'm bringing up exchanges as I think there's, there's kind of a change that we're going to see increasingly with, with Ethereum as we interact more with the rest of the world. Because with Bitcoin, you've got a currency which is just a meme, right, basically. It's just, it's, it's, it's just a number. And it kind of, if there are two of them, it kind of doesn't matter, except to the extent. I mean, how much of it have you got? This is what you care about. Um, but what we see with Ethereum is that it, now we've got DAI. And DAI is supposed to be one dollar, right? So DAI will not cleanly fork, probably. If, you have, if you've got a DAI which is supposed to be pegged to one dollar, it's pegged using Ether on that chain. If you then fork that chain, then one of three things can happen. One is that only one chain will have DAI that's still worth a dollar, and the other one will be worth zero dollars. Um, so that's just kind of blown up your whole forking governance backstop system because the minority, even if they're correct, no longer have a functioning uh, stable coin, which has just exploded, you know, huge swathes of, of, uh, of, of other contracts at this point. So, so that's bad. Um, maybe weirdly, if it's exactly balanced, you could end up with one dollar being two dollars, uh, one dollar each chain, which would be kind of great, unless you're a collateral holder, in which case it's kind of terrible. Um, or potentially they might both go to zero. Um, so firstly, those are all kind of bad outcomes. So we can't. So once we've got DAI, we can't just split the community in the way that we could at the time of the um, of the ETH TTC fork. It's gonna, you know, wreak all kinds of havoc. Don't tell them, um, guys. But then the, the, sec the second problem is um, who actually has the power to decide where DAI goes? Well, probably the guys who are publishing the main oracle. Um, and that's a fairly small number of people, and they now have all this power. But effectively, whichever side the maker go, oracle goes, that side's going to win. So now we do have a process, we, we do, do have a group of people, we do have the people you sue, the people who control the maker oracle basically control this chain, which is very chain wins. Um, so we can all go home, <laughs> because we don't have any choice anymore. This what is a really good point. Oracles called both chains? Yeah, the, the, yeah the, the Maker Oracle is basically a bunch of people signing sort of exchanges, or are they are they as it works? I can't, I can't be sure if it's exchanges, or if it's kind of custom parties. Yes. Uh, and the then Maker Dollar the, is one of them, they're all in there, so like exchanges on the Yeah. Of the, like, uh, price feeds. Yeah, but you're basically just needing these signed price feeds. But again, you have this pattern of the outside value right. feed, being yeah. the exchanges, or being, yeah. in that case, the Oracle. Right. Yeah, feeding in the outside value. Yeah, uh, carrying the day. Yeah, um, and, and and then going forward, the next thing that happens is that we're trying. If we're trying to, we're trying to change the world. We're not trying to make memes, right? So if we're trying to interact with the outside world, then you want to say, okay, I want to ensure my house, right? 
Um, I want to control the deeds of who owns my house on a blockchain. Um, when it was Bitcoin and when it was Ether, we could just split and then you'd have two Ether, or, or, well, one Ether on the brain, you see, or two Bitcoins, right? Two kinds of Bitcoin. Mm. But I've only got one physical house. So when we split the chain, we can't split my house. So where we were able to kind of equivocate, the world now has to decide on one. Um, and that then means that there are all these internal, act external actors, often potentially regulated actors as well, yeah. um, who, ne who now have control over which one do they set. When, when I say, I own this house, you don't own this house, and I get the court to enforce you know, the fact that I can live in the house and you can't live in the house, then you've got an external court deciding which is the way to hear Well, this is also the thing with the, the uh, like, class action lawsuit is exactly that, because there was no process in place where it could agree at before, like, yeah. so basically the outside courts have to decide, okay, what is, like, right, are they going to do this? Yeah. The, for the enforcement after that will be even more messy. Yeah. It goes in the same direction. Yeah. And the, and the other thing that the just dropped with, which applies to Bitcoin as well, is that the IRS finally announced their yes. view of how you pay taxes on, on forked coins. Um, and what the IRS said, which I think is technically correct, but has all kinds of nasty um, I impact, is that um, when you get a new currency appears, you have to pay um, taxes on the, uh, that asset that you just acquired. Um, so now the IRS is going to decide which is the pre-existing chain and which is the new fork chain. Um, and they're going to make you to pay taxes on the new fork chain. I think we have the same situation, actually. Yeah, it's, um, in our case, the argument against um, taxing the new chain was that right. you get the coins and you don't even know that you got them. Right, right. right. So sometimes they would be even just delivered to your yeah. address, um, and we actually yeah, made an argument. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we made an argument because we know some of the um, people that work for tax authorities, and mm. they do have addresses. Right. <laughs> we're just saying, hey, we're gonna <laughs> pump a lot of tokens into your account, and then you tax yourself if you're into it so much. Um, but yeah, they are going to be the most deciding on which chain is going to uh, remain. It's an awesome region. way to bribe people without having to go tax yourself. With taxes. <laughs> uh, but okay, so this um, kind of sounds like we are already having third parties that are deciding on our behalf, so we are kind of having a mediation process in place, or like just adopting the court systems. As well, we because there is no other process. And exactly, yeah. But also, yeah, they might not care what we decide. Right. I mean, yeah. how it might be actually much easier to just go with an existing court system and say, okay, you'll be the ones deciding. But there's plenty of different court systems in the world. So we don't really just have courts in many jurisdictions and then international courts for specific legal issues. We also have different organizations like WTO and health organizations, and they all have their own dispute mechanisms. So we, if we want to become much more independent, it seems to me as if we want that we will need to establish our own dispute mechanisms, yeah. so that we are the ones deciding which chain is the correct one and which one. And actually addressing those issues because those were the debates we had with like a workshop yesterday on the legal and Ethereum. Uh, also, what Vitalik was saying. Sorry, what Vlad was saying. Um, so like, if we are not going to take care of our own rules some other organizations or institutions are going to come in and say, okay, this is the right thing. Yeah, but then who decides who is going to be that institution? I mean, we are not talking about the American ones, okay. but... And, and, and also, who do you decide how who the stakeholders is? Yeah. Seriously. Um, what do you mean by we, we need to decide yes. what we... Yes. Um, exactly, that's a really good question. Like, who is the community? Who, who are the players? Who are the stakeholders again? Like, is it the Ethereum magicians? Is it like the, I don't know, the foundation? Sorry. No, I think uh, in terms of stakeholders, you can make a differentiation between like, um, um, like, so there are direct stakeholders that are the, the world in general, and it's the, the, the hardest part, I think, to include, like, uh, the, the same thing that we're trying to do. I don't know, like, uh, when you know it's about you know including the uh, river or giving it a right to a mm -hmm. river to have uh, like uh, some voice into some like organization and stuff. I think that's the very like tricky part that is not solved yet. I think in the blockchain space we have like in these organizations like very uh, a, gr a group of stakeholders that is uh, specific to it. For example, like the case of Bitcoin, like miners and users and developers. 
Um, many miners and users actually, because like without developers, the protocol can live from now. Like from the moment it's like implemented, it's not perfect, it can, it can live. But miners and users are the kind of contributors, stakeholders, the two groups that are like essential for the protocol to be. Like without users, like the, product, the value goes to zero, and without miners, the value goes to zero. And so you have this first like uh, first group of stakeholders that really has the the power. I mean, yeah, the developers are also like very important. Go to zero without developers too, because it's not scalable. So. Yeah, I mean, it can go to zero, but it can like, I mean, it can, without users, it will go like to absolute zero. If without developers, they can, you can still have some use but with if the, you have too if many you have, users and no developers, then that kind of... I mean, if you, if you have like <laughs> a community of miners uh, securing the network, it's very secure, and, and you have users like using Ethereum as a store of value, uh, I mean, no. it's still a value that you use. It won't scale. Like if, I mean, if once the users scale, go up and the developers go it's away, still like, it, it, maybe <laughs> some other network will scale, but maybe this network won't scale. Well, Sorry, <laughs> I'm doing this network. Just like you won't be able to like use it. Like so, if you can't if, use it, then you the can also go away. If if you what? don't have a problem with paying a transaction like hundred dollars to have buy like a twenty k Bitcoin because it's very secure. I mean, are you saying that if like the number of transactions in Ethereum today was like. 1,000 times and no one's like touching any of the code, like is it still going to work? Like are people still going to use it because of how I'm not very, I'm talking about like practical, uh, more like an abstract way of this, like distinction between like where the, the, the stakeholders are giving value to the network and profiting from the network directly. It's not the case of like developers have an interest into the network that, or you could consider in some way like the holders of the coin or so then, like they provide uh, development work to the network, and they're, you know, they they, they have like a stake in the network. But actually, like yeah, I, I see this like very close relationship with the uh, only within miners and users who really have this. I give value and I take value from the network, and that's an obvious relationship. I mean, developer could be included, but I think that's. Okay. I see. That I can answer to that. I don't agree, but it's good you pointing to this, these groups because I think um, on the one hand the miners are kind of non-elected, right, <laughs> metaphorically. Uh, on the other hand, um, the developers are actually to a very, to a very strong degree the ones who still call the shots. And they're also kind of not, there's no representation in a sense, but they still go, take the whole technology stack in the direction that they, that they, mm -hmm. like, that they find important. Just to be uh, blunt, I think a lot of the navel gazing that's typical for Silicon Valley is also happening in the blockchain space, of course, so developers are addressing more like the problems they are interested in, right? Not so much non developer things. So yeah, that's like very strong, I think, even when there's no fork, right? Or even when there's not an economic fork, but just mm -hmm. a hard fork that adds new features, but that shuts other doors that this feature is not going to uh, keep open. So and so, it's good. I, I think I don't agree that developers are such an important group here, but I agree with the. I agree with that. <laughs> it's kind of like saying like you know like uh, Aragon would be fine without like flock teams or some users or just a network. Yeah, I mean I think for anything to have value that's like technology, like there's always going to be have to be the people that are like. Improving and upgrading. Okay. And yeah, but if, if, like, I, I definitely agree with you. Like what you were saying, a uh, very important group today. Uh, but like, if you were to take, so say, like, no other protocol in the history of the of the you know, uh, society would be created from now, and developers disappear to tomorrow, and all we have left is like a protocol in the current state. Will we never use it? Will it? You know, um, now, like, it can still work. It will still have value. Uh, but if users disappear, no value. If miners disappear, no value. But if developers disappear, um, but I, I agree that in market, like where you can create a big, better protocol, like uh, winner it takes all, like yeah, goes to zero. That's market. an interesting extreme. I think if all the core developers decide that they're no longer improvements of the code, a lot of users would just switch. Yeah, but that's in, in the case of a, like an open market where like you would have some other protocol that would take their. Yeah, this is really great discussion. <laughs> um, what about transparency? So we kind of know 
where and how the core developers are discussing, we can listen to their uh, calls. But what about miners? Do we know anything about miners? Do we know this community? It's um, impossible to identify them. We just see the transaction going, but we, like, uh, in uh, as signals, we try to uh, gather the sentiment of different stakeholders in the Ethereum community to kind of see which uh, EAPs are supported by which groups. Uh, and one of the proposals was to uh, change uh, the protocol in a way that miners would kind of somehow switch uh, somewhere and indicate that they are either favor of the CEP or not. That's the only way we totally know that this amount of power is for the CEP or not. But uh, this uh, wasn't implemented, it still is not planned even to be implemented. And otherwise, they uh, asked to, like on, on the, when they discussed the fee reduction, mm -hmm. they asked like three miners to the call, one major, one medium, and one small. Uh, they tried to talk during this like one hour and a half, two hours, but then they didn't invite them for the further calls. They kind of just got their opinion, but it wasn't continued over time to, you know, to develop these solutions together. So it's still a challenge. Okay, what about mining pools? Like, there were some attempts also to tax uh, or to like, yeah, tax mining pools, um, I think especially in China. Uh, Rivera was talking about it in her book. Um, when we are talking about how independent or how autonomous a blockchain is and if we can actually stop it or not. Um, and I think having an access to miners or mining pools is very important also from this point of view. But it can also be dangerous for those miners. Yeah. If we start identifying them, that could undermine the whole idea of miners it's being anonymous, you know. Exactly. Like. But I mean, we know that mining pools are a reality, like how decentralized it actually is. Yeah. You know how centralized it actually is. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of like the, the cyberspace dream where all of a sudden, like, <coughs> like everybody said, all this internet is going to be so great and it's going to be attached from all, like, everybody's going to run their own names. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> everybody's going to run all names of everybody's like, point of infrastructure, but the reality is, like, in the end, you still look our national power grids and things like that. So it's like, if somebody wants to tax you, will, like, China just decides to tax its money, then there's nothing they can be able to do with it. They might move somewhere else, but um, that's, that's exactly the thing. It's like, if we don't provide like mechanisms to make this space sort of legible for a state, then the state is just going to come in and say, okay, this is what we need to make this, this space legible for us. It might be taxes, it might be uh, regulation, whatever. Like so, sort of the do we need to have a conversation with <laughs> directly? Oh, for, I mean, most certainly. I, mean, I, I don't see how we would not. It almost seems like we always go with the dream that goes into the extreme. So, also when you mentioned the internet, right? We yeah. wanted to dream of having a completely decentralized internet, but it didn't really end up being completely centralized. And same happened with the blockchain. But when you compare it to what was historically the previous thing that we had, it's much more decentralized than what we had before. So with the internet, for example, we had, well, okay, yeah, you, you might argue actually against it. I would love to hear the argument. Um, with, for example, the internet, what I see is that we had radio and television and the newspapers. And there were just a certain amount of people that was providing the information. And with the internet, we got so much many, uh, so much more of the people that are now capable of providing that information. Same goes with the blockchain. You only had the banks and now all of a sudden you have different cryptocurrencies, you have different wallets, you have different entry points, and yes, of course there are barriers, but at least we have an alternative. So it might still become a bit more decentralized. I mean, I, I, I totally agree, it's just, um, like I said, if, uh, if a state decides to intervene, then there's not much to be able to do. So that's why I think the, the most important thing is to sort of make this thing legible for a state so that they can understand it's sort of like, and if they want to tax us, then, then give them the tools to what well, like. What's I, interesting I, 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 about the state and the taxes is that the state itself is actually a decentralized mechanism and it is more decentralized than the kings were previously. Yeah, of course. So if you read the history of how the states and nation states were actually created, it's pretty much the decentralization of yeah. whatever the power dynamics were before that. So well, I mean, well, I, I wouldn't say it's decentralized more. I think it's 
uh, states are much more like well, I I just read um, Seeing Like a State, the book. I mean, it's a great book on uh, legibility, like how did you actually go from like kings to states? And it's like okay, you as a king want to understand okay who is actually living in the white domain. So you start going out, counting people, seeing what they do, and things like that. It's like like making the thing legible, making making the subject legible for the state. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can raise more taxes. Things like that. You can. It's always about taxes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the end, taxes is like money makes the world go round, uh, at least for the in the future, I would say. Uh, so. But we do have some institutions like checks and balances and like the differentiation of different powers in the state. So that, that would be kind of an idea of decentralization that Anya was, was telling about uh, before. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end, it's like. Going back to to the topic governance, like do no, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I'm just saying that the state, whatever the state is, will make this blockchain thing legible for the state. Mm -hmm. Whatever that may, might mean, it might mean okay in, in China or in uh, in Europe, you might have said okay, you have to register as a miner if you want to like operate as a miner. Might also just mean you can just continue as a miner and nobody gives a shit because the state just I don't know, doesn't see it's important enough to spend its resources on like dealing with this because it's just not important enough. But I think um, if we ourselves don't deal with like exactly this, this sort of like governance problems of making this like these processes understandable, then somebody else will come and make them come from the outside and say, okay, we need to understand this because you developers did not uh, save the money of like 20 people, which is around like, 200 million dollars. Why? Mm -hmm. And then they will make legislation mm -hmm. and just impose it on upon them. And you can decide that it's better to sort of say we as a community sort of try to figure out these processes, or we wait for somebody else from the outside and just come and look at it and say, okay, this is how it's going to work. But also, have you noticed that uh, one of the sponsors? DEFCON is it here in Pacific? Yeah. They were almost dead last year uh, when they published the tweet that they are out of funds and they can't develop it further. But then uh, AFRI uh, is now working with them and they got like two investors and they now are seeing the collaboration between uh, Ethereum 1 and Ethereum Classic because they can uh, develop the same software uh, tool to it. And I think in the future we might might prepare for the complexity and uh, like DEFCON 12 have uh, seven different Ethereum versions and still community coming and some uh, like for example that would be an unsuccessful version of Ethereum but still uh, traded on exchanges. Can, you know? can I say something to that because uh, actually what Ethereum tries to do is try to rejoin. Yeah. That's actually that's that's really interesting. Thing. They want to be the watch carriers of Ethereum 1x when the main report goes to 2.0. If that's not happening or not, I don't know, but it's interesting that there's also this urge, obviously, to be uh, to reunite. To reunite. Yeah. So wherever that comes from. I mean, <laughs> so but why? Why do you think it's so? Like, to remain relevant, reason? I think. Um, because, I mean, I it, seems, it sounds very human, human like yeah, uh, yeah. human motivations. Uh, just like in the end, uh, the for for uh, ideal reason, I guess. I don't oh, know. and that's that's uh, something actually uh, reminds me of. This is the Ares fork, which was one of the first forks where somebody uh, now that's Monax now. Um, a long time ago, they forked Ethereum and said, so we're gonna create the economic version or the, the business version of Ethereum. And then they actually started to alter stuff, and then they took it all back because they couldn't keep up with the pace of Ethereum itself developing. So they made themselves compatible again until they basically rejoined uh, the main uh, stream. So that's that's also interesting. So there's a, obviously a force that brings you back uh, to the table. So it's like we actually talked about it last night. Um, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with the word balkanization? Yeah? Okay. 
Can anybody explain it? Because I mean, we have one version of it because we come from the Balkan, <laughs> so it might not be the right one. Yeah, like the rest of the world thinks it's a bad thing that you're now independent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, <laughs> what else can it mean? Um, I mean, so in a way, balkanization that means that it's a fragmentation of a big uh, state, right? So it was a federation before, and then all of a sudden there was a notion that all states um, gained the independence and became sovereign. Um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, although we do hear our parents and our grandparents talk about how Yugoslavia was so much better, and that's a no, I think was. I was was very was the organization was more about like the supposed like needless structuring of the greater whole. Yeah, Got but, it. but it's, yeah. it's also yeah. kind of like being, I mean, well, supposedly it's, independent, right? It's a loaded word. Why is it loaded? I mean, we have to overcome that first, right? It doesn't make sense to use that load that brings with it that is critical of becoming independent as a, as a, as a unit that might make much more sense. I guess we, we, can't, we, we coined that term, presumably, when it was um, fracturing and resulting in the huge war, right? Mm -hmm. Which, to us, uh, to us, quite a confusing war with various different countries. You know, I don't even know um, how it was coined. I, maybe it was before. But the opposite of that was prison of nations. That's how the Austrian Empire was called. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's funny about it is that we were sovereign and independent for a couple of years, and then we joined the European Union. So we never really were a sovereign and independent state, as in not being connected to a greater whole. Okay, um, let me explain. No, no, no. So, so this, is, this is why I think that what we were discussing before, the, the fragmentation and all the forks, and then all of them uniting and coming back together, I think that's a very natural process. Do so you have a slopset discussion? <laughs> So we were kind of comparing this to like building your own company or building your own new state. When you're forking, maybe if you think about forking the DAO, um, I can copy paste uh, DAO and make it an old world. I don't know. The, the, the idea would be kind of different. Actually, I think in, when, when was it? I think it was in March. There were some colleagues saying, oh, we should fork um, MakerDAO. <laughs> so that would be interesting. Uh, and how, how would that, that is actually going forward. Is it? <laughs> yeah, there are some people working on it. That's all I have to say. Well, That's it? Can you update? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is interested. Uh, is, is, that, is that a software for, or is it an attempt to actually take all the existing well, collateral holders? Well, this intermediates the mechanism of Maker, right? Because, for example, as you have something being done about the, the key the key attack that Rune performed, or the last few months, or are we still, because after you... I think they just took care of it, like internally. I think you just won. And the thing is, that after you explained the importance of DAI, which I actually don't have enough financial education to understand my own, so thank you. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, let's look into that so Rune thing again. I mean, to be fair, it's not that important <laughs> yet, but that's where it seems to be, everything seems to be heading, that every app wants to have a stable coin, and the winning stable coin is DAI, so, Everything is going to be dying. I Can think it's very important. Us? Sorry. Can okay. you educate us on the attack? I don't know. If, uh, um, so basically, there, there was a, there was a, it was a multisig of seven people, and he basically physically and psychologically forced his partners to give him the keys, and now he holds all the keys of the like, multisig. Yeah. It's a document. Dictatorship. It's a it's a documented <laughs> like, <laughs> like real life attack. It's on it's online. There's like pages and pages of leaked memos from inside. It was a process that was happening about six months ago. Yeah. And now he can do what? Well, he, has, he has all the billions of funds of Maker at his command. He can, he can he's do, he, he is the CEO of his company and he wants it's good. But, so he's, so he, but specifically, he can control the price fees that he uses? Or? No, he, he, he has the he controls the entire multi so he can withdraw the funds if he wants. He can fuck off his uh, He should be able to leave. Well, what was the system before? So there were different people before, that had was to... Before, it was decentralized, or at least the name. No, no, no. no, no. There were several people that were I mean, it's not that much of a difference. Do you know how it works in Ethereum? They influence themselves so much that they are actually it's having no. physical attacks. It's not that much of a difference. No. As long as the seven people agree constitutional. Exactly. I mean, no. for him, it yeah, is yeah. easier. When do seven people agree constitutional? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> for the same purpose? If they, 
boom is on fire, we could have made you draw. So the key word there is cost. Yeah. Right. The question would be, is this the access to funds of MakerDAO, or is this access to uh, funds that the question, die? I'm not prepared to answer your question, but I will run a deep research. <laughs> It's no, not all the back of time. Maybe is it the emergency hold that's also I have no idea. That's, that's, uh, that's figured out. That was I, well, the, the money the company has, right? Well, the money yeah. that's yeah. all in the contract. Uh, uh, about 14 maker. Sorry, guys, I was yeah. too late. I don't yeah. know which part of the subject. Maybe you can join us here. I'm chunky to get there. I'll be here. Uh, there is this theory that we can evolve things until they get perfect. But there is the Darwinism. So if a lot of people form the project, some will survive, yeah. and some will mutate, and some will eventually evolve by birth and death of the project. So these are two conflicting philosophies, and we, we don't have a say which is better, but we humans are from the right side. So basically we are forms of each other that we can die based on, on the capacity of surviving. So this might be a good thing for software as well. It's a pretty long process though. Yeah. <laughs> well, software doesn't take that long. Yeah. You can do it fast. Yeah. No, but you but could say that you have generations of software. Why oh, definitely? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. There's, there's, there's versioning. I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a, um, sort of, the, I guess the way my thoughts evolved about this, is like originally when I was looking at, when I was using Bitcoin looking at smart contracts, I thought that we were making a machine. I thought, that, thought the model was a mechanical model where what you're trying to do, and if you read the things, all that stuff, that's kind of the idea that, that you um, you have this machine that you're going to put something in and it's going to follow these determined steps and then something's going to happen. So, and, and if you've got the machine, in theory, it can just run forever. Um, but then when I started looking at things like prediction markets, where there's this more problem of parasite, you know, if you have a, um, a prediction market system that's reliant on having a certain number of token holders, if there are too many users of this system, then it becomes insecure and, and there's this problem that occurs all over the place in, in crypto economics, where I, I started to think that these unchanging mechanical systems are actually not sustainable, and that you have something that's more like a biological system, where you've got a bunch of actors that are continually evolving, um, and if they don't continually evolve, then they're going to die. So if you have an animal that yeah. allows itself to be parasitized... Are you, are you technical? Uh, yes. You are. So, I mean, think of the basic structure of how DNA works, right? Right. So you can change that. Right. You can change a lot of what is programmed in the DNA, but yeah. if you want to change that basic structure underneath, you yeah. break everything. Yeah. So, I think that's where, uh, on the whole, blockchain went becoming too complex, because the original vision makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Then you have to create something that's super simple, that you don't have to change anymore. And then you have a layer on top of that where you can have this biological development, so to say. Mm -hmm. And then maybe every 10 years you also say, change that layer underneath, but it's going to be less controversial. We have that all merged into one, which way I think Ethereum got a lot more complex than planned. Um, even Bitcoin, probably, I mean, it was in the beginning much more simple and through that safer. So I think maybe it's just it happened that way, and maybe that's also a good aspect about when we talk about forking, is there maybe a proposition to be made that maybe stuff should be separated into layers so we have a different discussion about what a fork means and when it is necessary and how it might be then very clear that a certain fork is really just about the economic aspects and another fork. I mean, I mean that, that was part of the controversy of the die fork, I guess, was that um, you had the EVM and the, the assumption was that mo and most people would probably have agreed that if there was a bug in the EVM um, and that it was possible to, firstly you have to fix that bug, but also if it was then possible to take some recovery actions for uh, contact, the contracts that had suffered from that bug in the EVM, then that's something that people would want to do. And the, the, anal the analogy has happened in Bitcoin you know, on multiple occasions when, for example, there was an overflow and there were Bitcoins that were issued that shouldn't have been issued. And nobody said, well, those Bitcoins have got to remain after there was an interview over, right? Everybody said, okay, we'll fix it and we'll put it back to where it should have been. Um, but the controversy with the, um, the, um, the Dow um, rescue was that the, um, the bug was in a contract built on top of the EVM. The EVM functioned correctly 
However, it was built on contract on top of the EVM, but also all our documentation was wrong. Right? So if you were if you were coding, if you read Ethereum.org and you were using the EVM in the kind of the commonly accepted way, you may still have hit that bug. So it seems like from the point of view of a user, it's almost a distinction without a difference that the EVM is working correctly. But from my point of view, if I do what I'm supposed to do to make the EVM function, I still get hit. You yeah. Know, so, so, so that's, I think, part of where that controversy went, that some people said, no, no, look, the EVM is, it is correct, so leave it alone. And other people said, look, from the user's point of view, it may as well have been wrong. So we need to fix it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't think that's really happened. OK, yeah. But, but, I, but I guess the question is then, is there a sustainable, are the kind of sustainable layers um, about what you're going to say isn't going to change and what is going to change? Um, and and I, I definitely think that's a good conversation. And so so the, the, the practical example is that um, we discovered fa fairly early on that gas prices change. Um, and to me, it's always been something, it's always been an assumption as a, de as a developer that gas prices will change. Um, but apparently a lot of people didn't get that memo, right? So, so now we, it looks like we need to change the gas prices to allow us to, to scale Ethereum because there are, um, it's, it turns out that writing state, um, writing data to the chain is too cheap now, and also reading data from the chain is too cheap. Um, but then computational operations, for example, um, are too expensive in comparison. So can um, it help? Um, yeah. So uh, from what you just said, would it help to have a clarification yeah. for all the users yeah. and whomever the stakeholder is? What are the possible changes that can be made? Yes. And then having them all listed. Yes. And then next to that, how hard it is to change one of them or yeah. like uh, what it takes? Because to me, it almost seems like we also have these constitutions and in the governmental. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, all the states are running based on laws, but yeah. not all laws can be changed um, in a simple way. Yeah. And you have the constitution, which has a higher threshold, because yeah. it should be changed as little as possible, yeah. and as uh, with a, as less frequency as possible. Um, and then you have the bylaws that are changing very fast, and can be changed very severely, yeah. based on what the interest of the administration is. Yeah. And here it's pretty much the same. I mean, the gas is going to change just like the administration bylaws. Right. While the EV, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine is not right. going to change very fast enough. Right. Um, and it, we don't really want it to be changed as often yeah. because it's the layer zero. So the more layers we build, it almost seems like we're creating this hierarchy of yeah. all these layers. And then the highest layer is probably going to be what we are operating with day by day and can be changed according to what we need on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean that, that doesn't quite fit the gas example because the gas prices are in the EVM, they're in EVM detail, like a, a lowest layer detail. But so, so it may be that it doesn't actually quite correspond to the protocol layers. But I do think that there's kind of an implicit understanding about certain things that are kind of guaranteed to be Ethereum and other things that kind of aren't quite guaranteed. And that information, I think, is very badly shared. Um, and, and then on a practical level, there are a bunch of things that, um, that are gonna change in Ethereum 2. And the Ethereum 2 protocol developers kind of implicitly generally know that, but everybody else doesn't know that. And there's definitely a concrete communication failure there about you know, firstly, what is the implicit understanding that we try not to change? Um, the gas prices doesn't count, but the fact that you can store something does count. Um, and secondly, in practice, what is going to change in future? That information obviously wants to be sort of circulated and shared as soon as possible. Well, you wanted to ask something. Yeah, you were speaking about clarifying the information, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is a good effort, I agree, but I've seen a lot of uh, places where people know what is a constant, know what is a variable, but when a variable changes uh, ever two years, five years, or, or changes just a small amount and people don't even feel it, even knowing the difference between a variable and a constant, they treat a variable like a constant. Like, you don't mind the uh, uh, plate movements when you're flying from uh, United States to Europe. The, the distance is 
changing every year, but you treat it as a constant. There's no problem in that. But what happened with gas price is that it remains a, like a constant for a lot of time and people change it. If uh, it's possible to do this movement gradually and more constant, probably you don't even need to clarify better. People will know that this is a variable and we will, with no change, treat it as a constant just without no effort of communication. But do you expect that this will lead to a fork? Possibly. The, the, so possibly, um, not, not yeah. very probable, but... I don't think so, because I mean, it is a major change, right? It's going to break contracts that work now. And still, I think the expectation is, yeah, it's going to be understood as a technical, necessary security change. There's no, there's no economic interest riding on it, so it's probably not going to... I, I think that the, it looks like they pro it, it probably won't happen the way it was intended, but there was a plan for state rent which would have broken a lot of contracts and really broken kind of the reasoning between those, behind those contracts. And if I think that if the core developer team had tried to roll that out, I think there would have been a new uh, economic fork. And, um, I, I don't think it for should happen, but imagine a very badly writing contract with like hard coded amount of gas in the flow that will simply stop working after uh, the update and you don't have a proxy. The only way to run yeah. that code would yeah. be on uh, an older version or if you do some workaround. No, so it's possible. It's payments, uh, default payment uh, calls gonna break. Yeah. Because it's just gonna you know, be above the threshold. So yeah, a lot of stuff's gonna break. Yeah, and it's possible that people that like this stuff that's gonna break should keep on our versions or do some work around. I'm just saying that it's possible. Yeah. But well, my point is that because it's there's money writing on it, right? It's not like the DAO. People want to get their money re-unlocked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it's a lot less dangerous, and I, I think that's important. But if you if you got money in actual contracts and those contracts broken, then it, have broken, then it's definitely about money, right? Yes, but it doesn't sound like it. Otherwise, you would hear more alarms. I think that at least the, the current one, the current gas pricing will probably not yeah. freeze off. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's the state rate, which yeah. Yeah. although it's a severe hurting yeah. change. But I think because, and I think that's important because this traumatic events, I think only happen if there's money locked in. Mm -hmm. right? If somebody is set to regain or have, have their assets frozen, depending on the fork happening or not. And I think that should inform the whole idea about, okay, what are we even discussing? Um, that, that, the, the, I don't know. The, I don't yeah. think I think the BCH fork or the um, BSV fork really um, follow that. Um, I don't yeah. think well, it's only money either. It's like, let's say, there was money to be earned. Block, blockchain games take off big time, and then all of a sudden there's a fork. And my favorite blockchain game is always on one fork, and my, it's not supported by the company on the other fork. Like, I don't, I don't care about the money. I just want to play my game. Yeah. But are we aware that this could actually happen? That, that you can lose a part of your whatever you're doing activities because of a fork. No, it's not. It's not so much part of the activity, but say, okay, you as a company shows this one fork. I might personally, for whatever reason, choose the other fork, and then there's like a discrepancy just because. Mm -hmm. Before it worked, and now it doesn't work anymore, and there's no one involved. It's just, just yeah. and, and there might then again be economic incentive. Okay, if there's enough interest in both forks, then the company might say, okay, we support both forks or whatever it is. So we've copy pasted the systems that we are having currently, because like there is a lot of people that would simply delete Facebook, but not, they never do because we have groups of people and we have Messenger, and it's simply not. None other app exists that we that would allow me to migrate everything that I have on Facebook to that app that would function better and would not sell my data and would treat my data better and would not yeah, breach my privacy and stuff like that. So what I thought is possible with blockchain and having the permissionless systems is that we are creating a system where these migrations are going to be much more possible and possible. And now what you're saying is that because of the fork, we are actually back in no, the... No, what I'm saying is that, yes, you might still be able to play your game on the old fork, but there will, there will, I mean, if the company decides to just adopt the other fork and yeah, there are exactly. some breaking changes, then 
they just might not be able to you to play the new game. I don't know. Maybe there's a new item and you won't be able. To, mm -hmm. Your friend won't be able to get this virus. So. But mm -hmm. talking about Facebook, it's like it's it's code, but it's also the network effect. So yeah, of course. is it um, like is it more um, in, like in the future? Um, are there forks more likely to happen mm -hmm. or less likely to happen in comparison to the past? I mean, because like the network. It's going to be bigger. We are kind of used to how Ethereum works. Uh, we are using it. There are more and more. Yeah. In the case of Ethereum. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I no, no, I, 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 I have, have no. I, uh, you guys like know a lot more uh, than me about Ethereum and the specific types. Like stable. Yeah. yeah right. Like uh, Casper Labs. Is mm -hmm. it like the fork of Ethereum? Yeah. Can we say that? What did they do? Way, I see yeah. like tens of uh, forks of Ethereum near protocol. Everybody is working on scalability and so on. So they basically take and even uh, Libra have taken part of the Ethereum protocol, right? So it's already happening. I think there will be more and more. Yeah, but these are not really hard forks, right? Yeah. These are community. No, no, not even that. It's just like it's just using the code base. So it's like yeah. Fork, fork yeah, yeah. It's a software. It's a yeah. software. So in yeah. a way, that's like um, having a branch of a company. Sorry. Having like a branch of a company. No, no just using no. the. It's just using a library base. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's like it's just using the code. I think the more interesting thing is just where so actually fork technically, right? Uh, it is a technical, it's a developer yeah. um, term, and it, what it means is you part ways necessarily in the community or so, but you start to develop code that is not the same anymore mm -hmm. like what's here, what's developed here, and then you lose the synergy you might have if you stay closer together. And well, that's, in that sense, it's more a fork in the protocol, like in the, yeah, not so much in the software. The software might be completely different as long as you're using the same protocol, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but... I, I mean, mean, for example, taking to go, to go oh, yeah, Ethereum and Parity, yeah. Yeah. two yes, different things. Exactly. Exactly. I get it, but they, they were not a fork. Right? No, that was not that that's what I mean, like they're a completely different software, but they still speak the same yeah, language. I'm talking about like a GitHub fork. Oh, I see. Yeah. You fork it, and you might actually on GitHub it might mean you don't even change anything. It just means like you make a copy of this thing, mm -hmm. and that is ready to develop in a different direction mm -hmm. for some reason, and often for merging it back. Right? The technical term just means that. So when you talk of Ethereum forks, that means. Not necessarily they, they change much or they, they change a lot or whatever, but they usually have a reason and they don't necessarily take away the community of Ethereum, mm -hmm. right? Because they start something new. But technically, it's still a fork mm -hmm. because they, they use the code base of Ethereum as a starting point. But for uh, so, like, is it, is it like, uh, would you consider, like, for example, like, so we can take PTB, I, I don't know. That's uh, so, we, and basically a fork in the protocol. I, I would consider that pretty different from, like, for example, Libra reusing part of the code base to do something completely different and like not forking the version or whatever. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's you forking the repo if you want, like, and using some components. You can, that, but like here we're like it's portable. Like, what is being mined? It's basically a version of the state. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to. Do you have any other questions or comments? That was we have a lot of questions here. Yeah. Yeah. Should we summarize? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we had a lot of questions, and I actually think that we um, managed to got the answers to some of them. Um, not all of them. There's 22 questions. But altogether, I think it's a nice thing to talk about. Give it to me, I can keep. That's okay. <laughs> So my understanding is much better now. Um, we've got it first, especially if the DAI that was an interesting case. Um, and yeah, I think I would actually love to go with a table that has four quadrants and just find out whether we can uh, formalize the taxonomy of the forks and write it and have like a better understanding through a visual representation of it. Should we do a circle? Yeah. You feel good about it? Yeah? Go for it. Well, I think we should have had a paper and then and be more actionable and less debate. Less mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have most of it, but I enjoyed the part I took. I don't know. Uh, I can go. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think we would have. Uh, 
um, done better if we had more constraints. I never thought about the form problem before, to be honest. I kind of felt that, for example, the theorem, the theorem foundation, is kind of responsible uh, for maintaining the brand and the mean, you know, and the chain. So I know that, uh, like, when the DAO fork was there, uh, they did some communication, they watched the voting, and so on. So I think uh, they have at least some level of understanding how to react and it improves over time. And I'm not sure our users, like if when you said like we need to be responsible for what's it, I don't, I'm not sure users would be would care enough to participate in that. More than like they can join the Ethereum Foundation communication team or something. Uh, but that's uh, like we have the seven team, we can't follow everything so we just would find ourselves in some time again in a situation of having to change and just selecting what we will find legit. But uh, I found the conversation really interesting and as a uh, like first for me and the start of this dialogue in general. Thank you. Listening to some of your exchanges, um, <clears throat> partly like also like glimpses of like technical discussions because I mean, we'll talk about work from our own perspectives and stuff. Uh, I to think like more like a uh, high on social system level or whatever. But like one thing I understood also like, because um, we haven't even chatted about like, uh, you know, governance models and where the rough consensus, where the, the reasons, these good aspects, bad aspects, where it can work, how maybe can more formalized models can so what, uh, I'm trying to understand why like uh, people in Ethereum people like tend to say that uh, for the formal governance process is, is very hard to implement uh, basically because there are these new kinds of attacks and stuff and because like basically uh, as soon as you formalize something uh, the, the amount of complexity when you were t uh, mentioning like that you have to consider like a, a, a national electricity grid uh, into the, the you know the way you know different as mapping mapping different stakeholders that maybe have to be taken into account in the influence that they have and how like in the governance model you have to take all the influences that stakeholders have in the network and it's super super hard to do so yeah I'm trying to it's simple for like uh, a million million understand like the complexity of that part very interesting yeah I, I feel I learned a lot thanks a lot it was great ideas uh, I feel for the next iteration of this it would be um, I would be coming back to the initial questions I had, like uh, who do we think for, who do, who do we want to provide for. Um, I have my ideas, but um, that is, is a good thing, I think. But uh, yeah, great start. I think there was a lot of stuff on Earth. Uh, it would be great to somehow keep track of it. Uh, to me, it was very interesting and especially the part of the stakeholders so who do we need to address how are the like power play between those different organizations or non-organizations um, and I mean if we have a feeling that this is something that is actually taught to or it's just happening or it's just something that it's like a combination of different things like some person that is very charismatic or um, like convincing a group of uh, like a community which community, uh, how this interacts together. So yeah, just like opening a whole bunch of 